Mr. Suresh Raman, the President of the MMA, Mr. Srinivasan K. Swami, the son of R. K. Swami, and the gentleman who gave the introductory remarks today, Mr. Unni Krishnan, the former Managing Director of Bini Group, who gave us an insightful sketch of the man that we have come to honor and his memory, Group Captain Vijay Kumar, my fellow speaker, Dr. N. Gopal Sami of the Election Commission. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for this opportunity to participate in this centenary celebration of a visionary who created almost a new industry in, uh, in Chennai and in Tamil Nadu. The true mark of a man's life or a person's life is often only felt after their passing. I realized this in the case of my own father and so I'm delighted to hear of how many innovative and path-breaking activities Mr. Swami undertook and the kind of trail he has blazed and that his family is very successfully continuing uh, in, the, in his footsteps. So first I congratulate all of you and uh, I mark my respect again. This is a topic that, you know, now many states have got an equivalent goal. Just earlier today, I was in a discussion with uh, a few of my officers in the finance department. And they were um, just notifying me as we were discussing various things that even the state of Uttar Pradesh has announced a $1 trillion goal. Of course, the first difference between us is that by population, Uttar Pradesh is about three times the size of Tamil Nadu. So even were Uttar Pradesh to get to a trillion dollars in roughly the same time as us, it would still be at a per capita level at best one third because Uttar Pradesh is not only larger and three times our size, but it's still a growing population. Whereas in Tamil Nadu, we're already effectively a below replacement rate society. But, um, you know, slogans and uh, targets are important. They're important in the political discourse. They're important in setting a common agenda for everybody to work towards. But I want to talk a little bit about how we get from here to there. Where are we now and how we get from here to there. And I'll probably take three different perspectives on this. One, purely a mathematical or a macroeconomic perspective. Two, a kind of administrative or a top-down perspective. And three, a uh, uh, people-based bottom-up perspective and talk a little bit about the things we see or we're planning or we're doing from each perspective. And then if I finish, hopefully in about 20 minutes, I'm happy to take some questions. So first, mathematically, uh, the problem with such targets, of course, is that there are two or three major variables beyond our control. The first is, as I say, population. You know, the same gross economy has a very different feel depending on the size of the population and the rate at which it's growing. The second is that we don't control the value of the dollar. So if you have dollar goals, for example, at 70 um, rupees to the dollar, Tamil Nadu's economy is already almost 320 billion. At 80, it's not even 300. So, you know, these things are not in our control. And finally, uh, these kinds of targets are set in what we call nominal terms, that day's money. And when you set it in nominal terms, you have a variable of inflation or the weakening of money that is also not in your control. But I don't want to get you know, into uh, the minutiae of uh, macroeconomic detail. If we assume that we're starting roughly at around 300 and we have to get to roughly around a trillion, uh, assuming that there's not any dramatic movement in the exchange rate, then really mathematically we're looking at uh, uh, compound annual growth rate or CAGR 
of about 14 to 15 percent a year between now and the year 2030. That seems like a lot except for the fact that inflation, even the RBI's upper range of the target is 6 percent and globally we're experiencing, experiencing relatively high inflation now. A whole different debate why we got here and how we got here and whether it's controllable, but that's for a different day. Realistically, the only thing I want to point out is that to achieve about a 14-15% CAGR is neither that uh, big a stretch nor historically unprecedented. So, for example, uh, in the years 2006 to 11, uh, we achieved about 10.15% real growth, X the effects of inflation. If we assume inflation was 5 to 6 percent, we were averaging 15 to 16 percent growth between 2006 and 2011. In fact, I would say the odds are that inflation stays closer to 6 percent for the foreseeable future than, let's say, closer to 4 for various reasons around the world. So it's eminently uh, doable in terms of just the mathematical uh, requirement and the fact that we have done this or better before. In fact, were we to hit 10%, you know, CAGR in real terms, we'd probably hit 16, 17% in nominal terms. Then we look at macroeconomic variables that are beyond our control. And I would say we have some very good tailwinds and a couple of looming threats. From the tailwinds perspective, the diversification away from China, the kind of um, logistical delinking from China and um, the increase in the scale and scope of the Indian economy all benefit Tamil Nadu disproportionately. Uh, we are one of the preferred destinations of the global de-risking and, and uh, decentralization. And as has been the case since 1991, since the year of the reforms, uh, we generally have a levered rate relative to the Indian average. So if the Indian economy grows at 6 or 7%, we tend to grow at 8 or 9 or 10. That's because we have good infrastructure, relatively speaking. Relatively speaking, a very well-educated and relatively large and young workforce and better connectivity than most people in terms of ports, airports, uh, internal uh, transportation, etc. So. There are some good tailwinds. In fact, we have seen 40-50% increase in global investment since last year. Uh, we're continuously fielding uh, new inquiries and trying to close new transactions. Uh, this morning, for example, I had the uh, uh, Vice President of Uber uh, Global from uh, the Bay Area here talking about uh, how they could help with public transportation models and new approaches. So I think in many ways we will benefit from that. The one real fear I have, and this is not unique to us, is that we are in an unprecedented situation in terms of global liquidity and global fiscal kind of uh, constraints. If you look at uh, global monetary policy since 2008, uh, there's been unprecedented liquidity, probably to the order of four or five trillion pre-COVID and then another two or three trillion since then, excess liquidity sloshing around in the system. Very few countries are like Singapore. I had a, a meeting with a senior officer in the Singapore government last night. They are desperately uh, issuing new securities and soaking up the excess liquidity in the market to avoid the kinds of problems they see elsewhere in the world. But if you look at the US, if you look at the UK, if you look at Europe, even if you look at India, we are looking at uh, inflation levels not seen in decades, uh, globally, probably in 30, 40 years. That's because you have all this excess liquidity on monetary policy, uh, and after the pandemic, most governments did a lot of fiscal stimulus. So till it was only monetary stimulus, inflation was contained because the money was not actually reaching the hands of the people who could spend it. And so inflation was within control. But fiscal stimulus by design gets it into the hands of every citizen or the lowest part of the, uh, the economic structure. And so they spend it, and then they invest it. And they do, you know, like low level stock investing as opposed to the big conglomerates that got access to the liquidity and were buying real estate and market assets and things like that. 
So it's a real risk. Um, I've never seen this rapid a rate increase in the 20 years I lived in the US. Of course, it started from unprecedentedly low levels, but I've never seen this kind of a rapid rate increase um, by the Federal Reserve of the United States, and many other banks are keeping up with it. So the only thing I'll close this whole segment is that there is a reasonable risk there is a global recession and that cannot, I mean, that the, the central banks of the world cannot engineer a soft landing uh, through an unprecedented storm of liquidity and inflation. Now, let me look at this top down. Top down as a government, our job first is to manage the fisc of the state properly. It is an undeniable truth in textbooks in RBI reports, in the statistics we see every day, that states which borrow for capital investment and states which control their interest payments as a percentage of their total revenue spending tend to have better growth going forward. That is a truism. I uh, quoted it right out of the RBI book at my maiden speech in the Tamil Nadu Assembly in July of 2016. It's as true then as it is now, or it was as true then as it is now, and there's no change in that. So from that perspective, our first job as a government is to bring the FISC under control and meet those two criteria, that we borrow only for the sake of investment and that we control the interest cost as a percentage of the revenue. Now both those have deteriorated dramatically uh, between 2014 and now. Between 2003, the passage of the FRBM Act in uh, Delhi and the FRA Act in Tamil Nadu in 2014. Across all parties, the fisc of the state kept improving. Debt to GDP came down from 28, 27% down to 16, 17. Interest revenue came down from 21, 22% down to 10 to 11. Till there was serious political leadership that had some view. Our view may have been different than that of Ms. Jalata and the ADMK. But as long as there was some leadership executing some view, the fisc was in control. After her incarceration in 2014, things turned dramatically worse. And for eight years in a row, we had record revenue deficits, culminating in a revenue deficit of about 62,000 crores in the year uh, 2021. We have started to make a big dent in that in 21-22, though coming to office after 10 years and spending about 20,000 crores more than was planned in that February in the interim budget and losing about 8,000, 9,000 crores in revenue due to multiple lockdowns for phase two and phase three, or wave two and wave three. Uh, we still reduced the revenue deficit and the fiscal deficit by 16,000 crores last year, first turnaround in eight years. And we are on track this year um, to do something similar. So when we borrow less for revenue expenses, we are able to invest more because we have a debt ceiling, uh, both in terms of the FRA Act and more stringently by the one imposed by the union government on all states using their article 293.3, uh, the equivalent of first lien rights where they limit our borrowing. So uh, the less we borrow for revenue spending, the lower we pay in interest later, the more we invest this year, the more capacity we have to build a buffer for the future. Because under the terms of the 15th Finance Commission, if we do not use the allowed borrowing limits, we are able to roll them over till the period of expiry of the uh, 15th Finance Commission, which is 26, after the one-year extension that the Prime Minister gave them due to COVID. So uh, we are doing that part properly. Now, the second part is to improve ease of doing business, because the government can only do so much. What we really need is private investors to uh, step up and private entrepreneurs and, and, you know, and independent businesses, particularly in our state, the MSME sector creates about 70, 80% of all jobs. And so we need to make it easier for them uh, to do what they do, which is take risk, um, build rewards for themselves, employment for people, and improve the overall economy of the state. We are doing quite a lot um, by partly through departments like mine, where we are now actively engaged with the state level bankers committee, ensuring the access of credit, ensuring the distribution of the client base 
rather than concentration into a few clients to make it reach as many um, entrepreneurs as possible, partly through improving communication and training through the MSME department, whose secretary happens to have a double hat as my expenditure secretary in my department, so we work closely together. Um, there's a lot more we can do, but Guidance Tamil Nadu, which is our single window promotion agency, um, almost routinely wins Best Agency of the Year awards. And um, as I say, we're beefing up on the PP, I mean, on the uh, uh, MSME side and in um, generally reducing the red tape. I'm also starting to have discussions with my counterparts in Andhra, in Telangana, in uh, um, Kerala, particularly with Telangana, which is the most direct competitor to us. I've had a couple of conversations with my friend KTR. I think we need to make sure that we don't get kind of, um, you know, cannibalized into transactions that are long-term disruptive or destructive of value, but that's something that's on the fringe. The biggest constraint, believe it or not, for the government of Tamil Nadu is not money, actually. It is the capacity to execute on time, under budget, and deliver finished outcomes as planned. That's not new to or unique to the government of Tamil Nadu. That's uh, all over the place. Uh, but in Tamil Nadu, we have this problem because our capital expenditure ratio went down from almost 3% of GSDP in 2011 down to about one, one and a quarter, one and a half at the bottom in 2021. Now, when you reduce your spending that much relative to the scale of the economy, clearly the capacity of execution does not sit around idle waiting for you to spend that kind of money. So some people go out of business, some machines get moved, some companies diversify, some relocate. And so overall, our ability to execute as quickly as we can provide the funds is in fact a bit constrained. And that's partly a legacy problem, as I say, after seven, eight years of falling investment, uh, it's not likely that you can just turn that uh, switch on overnight. So it will take us a while. And particularly, we are very focused, therefore, on more and more PPP, you know, rather than the government of India's model where you build something first and then try to monetize it later. We believe that doing it as PPP, not for core things like, you know, uh, citizen services like drinking water, but for construction, for infrastructure, for ports, for airports, for uh, roads and so forth. The greater value of a PPP model is not just that we leverage capital. And even Ms. Jalta had a model under her vision 2023, though it never got executed. The vision was to double capital expenditures from 3% to 6% by having the 3% borrowing limit borrowing plus 1.5% surplus in revenue plus 1.5% of private investment, either through funds or directly into projects or in partnership with the government in some other PPP way. I'm not sure we can get to 6%, but certainly our ambition is for us to get to 3% and to find another 1%, one, 1.5% one in PPP. Again, I say not primarily for the capital, but mostly because they will bring the execution skills, the EPC capacity, the engineering talent, uh, the ability to deliver on time under market discipline of the capital they have raised and they need to answer to. So I think top down, this is the way we see it. We need to ramp up our annual capex back to 3% of GDP or GSDP. With just to put that in a quantitative model, this year our uh, nominal GSDP is estimated about 24 and a half lakh crores. If we continue down this path, we will be at 30 lakh crores or so in two years. So 3% of 30 lakh crores, about 90,000 crores. If we have reduced or eliminated the, the def revenue deficit by then, which is the track we're on and that I'm committed to, barring a global recession, everything is subject to that, then we will end up tripling our capex in two or three years. And as long as we can find the execution capability to do that much capex in time, then uh, we will certainly see a huge multiplier effect and not have a problem reaching our uh, 15, 16 percent uh, CAGR in nominal terms. 
but there's a third component or a third perspective to this just because i have the money just because i have the engineering capability or a company with the administrative bandwidth or or systems does not guarantee outcomes at the end of the day it is the people that are the most important asset or limitation of any society of any community of any um, state and since we are in a global economy whether we like it or not the final deciding variable is per capita productivity the higher we have a per capita productivity the more globally viable and competitive we are and the better the quality of life we can deliver to our citizens if we do everything else right and in particular i would focus first on the notion of inclusion you know different people have different philosophies um this saturday's economist carried an article and was called the gujaratification of india i basically showed how the investment ratios had changed uh, how much towards capex how much towards social spending um and so forth and uh rightly or wrongly they took compared gujarat and tamil nadu and they said the two of us have roughly the same per capita income in fact that was a bit generous gujarat slightly higher than ours we are about two and a half times the national average or two and a quarter times and they are about you know another two three basis points higher about 8000 rupees or something more but the poverty rate in gujarat is four times the poverty rate in tamil nadu so we are fundamentally different societies in terms of the distribution of wealth in terms of consumption in terms of education in terms of access this is a very important distinction because if you want to build refineries and robot driven manufacturing plants it doesn't matter what your human resources are you're going to be picking only the cream of the crop anyway but if you want to build a wide based uh kind of average productivity model where many people get better off and not a few then you have to have to have to increase per capita productivity and increase inclusion in the formal or informal in the quantifiable economy so from that perspective i would say the more we invest in children for example in the remedial education program tamil nadu is a pioneer our illam thedi kalvi has now been written up and presented at the un national uh, assembly the general assembly where we have for 2% increase in spending we have achieved a 17% improvement in the remedial upside of coming back to school and having them reacclimatize to uh, actual formal education we have started uh, under the chief minister's leadership a pilot program to provide free breakfast to uh, young children because most mothers are not able to actually get up and cook and supply the food to their children deliver the food to their children before they go to work or before the children go to school which is often very early 7:30 8 o'clock in the morning not only that in the inlam teri kalvi we found that the attendance was much higher if the mother was less educated or if the family was poor it was natural self selection and therefore the benefit was much higher to those students whose parents were not educated than it was to students whose parents were otherwise able to cope with them at home what you'd expect the other huge variable i think is to truly be inclusive of women in every aspect of the economy now we take some pride in tamil nadu uh, in the justice party government starting in 1921 women were given the right to vote before any almost any other place stand for office we had women legislators we had a women uh, deputy speaker or leader of the um, madras legislative council uh, compulsory elementary education when legislated in 1921 covered both boys and girls we have almost 85% of all uh, 18 year old girls have either graduated uh, high school or you know gone through high school that's not so in most other places in gujarat it's 50% but that is only a beginning that is nowhere near enough every time i go to a school or a college especially women school women colleges i i exhort them i say having gotten this good education having come this far 
having more girls be rankers in the exams when we were still publishing ranks or in entrance exams and so forth too few of them get to operate in the quantifiable gdp calculable economy many of them get married or you know for other reasons don't participate and so the government is focused on increasing their activity in multiple ways Uh, starting with something as simple as providing free bus bus transportation so that they are not dependent on anybody and can actually find their way to work even if it is as domestic work or anything above that in terms of uh, you know payment then the free bus rides uh, enable them empower them and free them up from constraints uh, we focus on a lot of other ways to bring more women into the workforce we found that though tamil nadu has the highest um gross enrollment ratio into tertiary education at 52% almost double the national average and 15 points higher than the second state which is kerala in fact that was not universally distributed there was a dismally low college enrollment rate for girls coming out of government sponsored or government run schools so we have now put out this new scheme where any girl who comes out of a government school at 10th class and joins an iti or a polytechnic will get a 1000 rupee a month scholarship and anyone who comes out of 12th class and joins a regular college will get a 1000 rupee a scholarship 1000 rupee a month scholarship till as long as they are in school and passing and what this has done is actually created at least prima facie an increase in the enrollment because in the last slbc meeting we got the statistics from the banks which is where they have to go and enroll for these benefits and scholarship that all applicants prior to this year's first year students were only about 1.6 lakh so that's first year i mean second year third year fourth year across all colleges all kinds of places was only about 160000 we thought it should be much higher but this year's first year batch alone is almost 1 lakh applicants so some of it could be just that the awareness is higher because you can't you know you can't suddenly decide to join second year you must have already been in college but some of it surely is that more people are enrolling because the government makes it viable for them to go and enroll and pay because most government colleges are very low tuition anyway it wasn't the tuition that was a problem it was all the other expenses so you know we look at that and then we have this mismatch we have a very unique situation in tamil nadu well most place in india where we have a surplus of college educated graduates who are looking for work on the one hand and many companies who say that they don't have enough employment ready or skill ready um workers to recruit on the other hand so this disconnect i suppose it's only to be expected if you expand the scale of education you know uh, multiples in a short time when uh, my friend arvind vasu and i graduated from rec trichy i think the state of tamil nadu graduated about 3 4000 engineers a year now it graduates about 150000 now if you have that kind of uh, ramp up in less than 30 years or 40 years uh, that comes with a lot of attendant problems and partly to fix those problems partly to give proper career gu- guidance counseling to current high school students and their parents uh, the cm has in- inaugurated what he calls his pet scheme which is the non mudalvan scheme which is the kind of uh, skill and work ethic and kind of finishing program model to increase the employability of the workforce both existing young people who don't have jobs as well as future generations that will come out of school and this program we are working closely with many different models including with uh, multiple organizations in uh, from germany where they have a skilled apprenticeship model of very highly paid skill trades particularly in the automotive and robotics and other sectors uh, but we have, we have uh, you know somebody the other day pointed out that uh, ibm is working closely with us and creating a lot of um, certified programmers for uh, particular kinds of uh, needs so we can look at it you know mathematically macroeconomically we can look at it from administration from a fiscal perspective most of all from a 
people development and the human perspective and so i would say in conclusion that barring a global recession uh, i am very hopeful that because we will do our part that the people of tamil nadu will certainly uh, step up and uh, put their best efforts and so uh, we will get to our goal in time on the other hand if we were to see a global slowdown or worse heaven forbid as i have said in the assembly to my fellow members as i say here uh, tamil nadu is better hedged than most uh, i was above all a risk manager in my career in the financial industry financial services industry and so i have applied you know my own way of thinking and ensured that we are properly hedged as best we can be uh, because you see a recession doesn't mean that money disappears it just means that growth slows down or goes negative that's when governments really need to step up spending and support the bottom of the pyramid and um, stimulate demand and so you know we are better prepared than most and certainly better prepared than uh, we have ever been as a state i would say so let me close there by just saying that in the final analysis there are probably three important things that i can see if we have to achieve relatively above average outcomes or at least above average to our last uh, decades history the first i think is that we should have compassion to me the overarching quality of a public servant of a government of a party of a philosophy is humanity is that we are here for improving the lives of people starting with those that are uh, the worst off the least uh, provided with opportunity the most constrained and some of that is structural some of that is cyclical not everybody stays at the same place um in life every day for example today we had a professor from the harvard kennedy school as part of our jpl engagement and we were talking about you know purifying the list for the chief minister's commitment of delivering 1000 rupees um a woman and we were thinking about many things and then we suddenly realized actually none of this is permanent once you whatever model you develop nobody stays in the same place all the time some people improve some people fall behind some people get hurt some people lose their job so really we ought to have a system that is flexible enough and dynamic enough that we should be able to find those in need today and there's no permanently in need and permanently not in need and so we need to think more dynamically about that the second quality i would say is competence everybody talks everybody talks big question is can you deliver what you say you will deliver and i think uh, very few people focus on that and very few people actually deliver that i am very uh, proud to say my chief minister every day uh, holds us to that standard what is the outcome you know everybody can say that we are fit we are good we are great what is the outcome do your results prove that you are doing the right thing and to do all of this i think uh, you really need courage political courage because without reform there is no improvement you can't keep doing the same things and expect that suddenly the world will give you better results you want better results you got to do things differently and better and in politics you know reform is a very dangerous word i think uh, uh, many of you may have seen Uh, the average age is not so young yet seen a, a comedy series called yes minister and yes prime minister and whenever the uh, the civil servant uh, sir humphrey wants to put a noose around uh, his minister's neck he waits till the minister makes a proposal he says yes yes that's all good very good that's great and then he says but minister that's a very courageous decision <laughs> that's that's the uh, anathema uh, in politics is how many people can make courageous decisions so i'll close by saying that i've been very fortunate uh, to have a chief minister who 
himself makes courageous decisions and most importantly backs me uh limitlessly backs me when i have to make courageous decisions and so the confidence i have that we can deliver outcomes is based on his ability to have those kinds of uh, you know strengths anyway with that i'll i'll stop i spoke a little longer than i wanted uh but i hope it was uh, somehow the dots connected and um